Hi, I'm Professor Jim Holmes joining you today at the U.S. Naval Institute. With great responsibility must come great power. And for the United States, a republic separated from the Eurasian rimlands by thousands of miles of water, great power means great sea power. America cannot accomplish its goals in the world without a great Navy able to fight its way across the oceans, control the sea lanes, and project power onto far distant shores. Our Republic has taken on great responsibilities and must field implements of maritime might sufficient to carry out those responsibilities. Superhero aficionados will have realized by now that I am riffing on a bit of sage advice from Uncle Ben Parker to his, to his nephew, Peter, better known as Spider-Man. Uncle Ben told Peter that with great power comes great responsibility. Because Peter had the gift of superpowers, he had an obligation to use those powers for the common good. Spider-Man knew his superpowers would always be there, so he had a good idea of what he could accomplish. Nations have no such luxury. They have to set purposes and produce the power to accomplish those purposes. That demands conscious effort on the part of all elements of society. Nations come to ruin if their ambitions outrun their means. Spider-Man would be awestruck at the scale of the regional and global responsibilities the United States has taken up since its founding. Yet generating limitless power to fulfill chosen responsibilities is not an option for the United States or any other nation. That sets us apart from Spider-Man. We have to set priorities and enforce them ruthlessly, lest we exhaust our human and material resources. The people, government, and military have to make the conscious political choice to remain a great power, and they have to reaffirm that choice over and over again. Today, as ever, American society and government confront a stark choice. We could shed some of our international bur burdens and embrace humbler political aims. In that case, we might get by with modest military forces, though at greater risk and danger. Or America could keep shouldering heavy responsibilities and maintain power adequate to attain them. Either way, the U.S. Navy constitutes the long arm of foreign policy for our ocean-going republic. Our leadership and our people show little sign of wanting to offload their international burdens. Therefore, only a Navy capable of, of executing an offensive strategy across transoceanic distances will do. It has been this way for a long time. U.S. history is the story of constantly expanding ambitions and power. What are some of the functions we've taken on over the decades? First, access to foreign seaports. There are commercial, diplomatic, and military dimensions to access. Alfred Thayer Mahan tells us that access is the core of maritime strategy. Commercial access comes first. It's both the goal and the driver of maritime strategy. The purpose of maritime strategy is to secure access to regions where U.S. firms want to do business. Trade and commerce enrich our nation and provide tax revenue that the U.S. government can invest in various capabilities, including a Navy to protect the sea lanes. Mahan sees a virtuous cycle between commerce and the Navy. The merchant fleet, in effect, helps pay for its naval guardian. Diplomatic access is necessary to facilitate commercial access. That's what nautically minded ambassadors and consuls do. Military access to trading regions is necessary to facilitate diplomatic and thus commercial access. For Mahan, that is, the US Navy is an enabler for prosperity. Commercial, diplomatic, military access. Mahan makes it quite clear that this is the relative order of importance to the nation. But it can't happen without the Navy. We need a great Navy to underwrite economic well being. Second, hemispheric defense. In 1823, President James Monroe and Secretary of State John Quincy Adams articulated the Monroe Doctrine, which in effect said hands off the new world to European empires with the exception of the British Empire, with which the United States shared common purposes after the late unpleasantness known as the War of 1812. Purposes such as keeping rival empires from returning to the Western Hemisphere after Latin American republics staged a series of revolutions to kick out their European overlords. In effect, the Monroe Doctrine announced that the United States would regard any effort to restore direct or indirect rule over Latin American republics as an unfriendly act and act accordingly. Britain's Royal Navy was the silent enforcer of the most Monroe Doctrine for most of the 19th century. Again, mainly because the British government wanted to keep rival empires from reestablishing their holdings in the Americas. But British maritime supremacy was on the wane by the turn of the 20th century. Fortunately, Congress funded the U.S. Navy's first armored, steam-propelled, 
big gun battle fleet starting in 1883. The fleet matured enough by 1898 that the United States could evict Spain from its Caribbean and Pacific Island empire and take over that empire. In other words, British decline and America's ascent in the Western Hemisphere left the U.S. Navy presiding over maritime security across half the globe. That is great responsibility and great naval power by any measure. Third, balancing in the rimlands. From the late 19th century forward, geopolitical thinkers such as Mahan, Theodore Roosevelt, and Massachusetts Senator Henry Cabot Lodge foresaw threats to the Americas from the rimlands of Western Europe or East Asia. Americans were complacent about their geographic position. The Atlantic and Pacific Oceans acted as ramparts against invasion or other forms of power projection from Eurasia. By the turn of the century, after our battle fleet took to the seas, it was doubtful any single Eurasian country could do the United States or its neighbors harm in their own hemisphere. But what if a hostile nation or alliance won dominion over one or both of the Rimlands in its entirety? Then, said the Mahans, TRs, and Lodges, such a foe would gain control of all the maritime resources of Western Europe or East Asia. It would have the wherewithal to construct naval and military forces able to reach out and touch us in the Americas. As a preventive measure, it behooved the United States to keep the Rimlands fragmented among competing powers. In turn, it needed a Navy able to project influence across the Atlantic and Pacific, frustrating the ambitions of domineering powers. To shape events in the Rimlands, though, the Navy had to be able to get to the Rimlands. During World War II, Yale professor Nicholas Spikeman, perhaps the most eloquent exponent of a Rimlands strategy, pointed out that to shape events in the Rimlands, an offshore power such as the United States that wanted to balance among various competitors needed a Navy able to command the marginal seas adjoining Eurasian coasts. The marginal seas being the Mediterranean Sea, Baltic Sea, South China Sea, and so forth. Only a great Navy can seize control of waters off hostile shores and project power onto land, foiling the pretensions of would-be hegemons. Here again, the lesson is clear. And fourth, management of alliances. Since World War II, America's strategic position in the world has depended on a family of standing alliances, from NATO and the Atlantic theater to the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance in the Western Pacific. These are some of the most durable alliances in history, without which we could not have prevailed in the Cold War or preserved the international order at sea in the decades since. They gave us geographic position. They faced off against serious competitors from the Soviet Union and its allies back then to China and Russia today. These alliances confronted major challenges and prevailed. But leadership of an alliance is doubly demanding. If the United States wants to lead these multinational fellowships, it needs to contribute the bulk of the resources to the undertaking. There's a kind of golden rule to alliances. The ally that contributes the goal makes the rules. The United States cannot expect to lead unless it invests outside economic and military power, including sea power, to combined endeavors. To remain the dominant ally in Eurasia, the United States must maintain the world's premier navy. So we have a compelling rationale for remaining supreme at sea, along with our brethren in the U.S. Marine Corps and Coast Guard. How do we here present today fire enthusiasm for such a force among lawmakers, ordinary people, and other important constituencies? In part by preaching the gospel of sea power, this is a task for all seafarers. Navy sailors, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen are all elements of our national fleet and have a stake in this. So think of yourselves as ambassadors to the American people. Look for opportunities to explain what you do, describing how you execute ta tactics maintain hardware, and on and on. But it's not all about the technical side. Tell sea stories. People love stories, and they respond to the lore of the sea. If we can get them to think about maritime affairs, we can trust to them to make wise political decisions relating to sea power. We and our friends around the world will be better off for it. And Uncle Ben will smile. Thank you.